Let's get straight to our newsmakers this morning, and that would be U.S. Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, who's also joined with a special guest. That's U.S. Steel's President and CEO David Burrett. Gentlemen, thank you both for being with us today. Good to see you, Becky. Good to see both of you. Uh, Wilbur, we know that we're going to be talking about trade and tariff, and I'd very much like to get to those issues. But, Mr. Byrd, I believe you have some news that you're going to be talking about this morning, too. You have facilities that have been idled because of the price of steel that you are planning on reopening. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, thank you very much for having us, and uh, we're really excited to be able to tell our employees in the community in Granite City, Illinois, that we will be calling back 500 employees. This um, feels like the beginning of a renaissance for us. We're finally doing the right thing for American workers after decades, decades of unfairly traded uh, steel into the United States. So we're really happy and delighted to share with everybody that uh, we're getting back on track after so many years. Mr. Burrett, the Granite City uh, facilities had been idled since December of 2015. What, what happened? What caused the idling? Well, it's the unfair trade. You know, if you're not, uh, if you don't have customers here to sell to and, and you can't make money, you have to shut them down. And we've seen our facilities go from uh, 15 facilities here in the most recent years down to seven. The thing to remember here is that U.S. Steel was the original iconic corporation. Back, to, back in 1901, we actually had a, a value of a billion dollars, a market capitalization of a billion dollars. And in January of 2016, we were actually less than a billion dollars. And here we are working hard every day, trying to get the things back on track. And we finally get some good news because we got some courageous leadership in the administration. And big, big thanks to uh, Commerce Secretary Ross and certainly uh, President Trump for taking the leadership and righting some wrongs. It's uh, really important that we get this right, and finally it's happening. One more very quick question. What we've heard in the pushback from people on the opposite side of this issue this week has been that, um, look, the jobs aren't going to come back regardless, that, that so much has been automated in uh, the steel industry and in the aluminum industry. What, what do you say to that argument? Well, I think the, the jobs are coming back, and, and for every job that comes back, the statistics that we've seen is that for every job that comes back, you multiply it, apply it by about seven. So there will be jobs coming back. And, you know, you think about U.S. Steel, we're an integrated mill. So we have mine sites in Minnesota. We, have, uh, we uh, go to Appalachia for our coal. And so when we bring back jobs, it has impacts on our surrounding communities. But the more important issue here is you've got to be able to make stuff in the United States. And if you take away our ability to... To, to make things, to manufacture yeah. things, you, you don't really have a society. You know, just think about the way the UK was. You used to have a big manufacturing base, it went away. And if you don't make stuff, you can't have a strong country. You can't protect yourselves and uh, you go by the way of Greece or maybe Puerto Rico. We have to be able to make things in the United States. It's really important that we do. That's the bigger issue. If you take away right. the steel industry, you're going to be held hostage to those outside this country, and you won't be able to take care of yourself. That's the real issue. Secretary Ross, we have heard from you since the president first announced these uh, tariffs that we're expecting. And just weighing in at this point, there have been so many Republicans um, from the head of the House, from the head of the Senate, to business leaders who have pushed back on this. You just heard what we said uh, from the WTO, from Canada, from the EU today. Is it your understanding um, Will there be any carve-outs for this? Will there be any exemptions uh, for these rules? Well, the president indicated the other day that he has a willingness to give an exemption to Canada and to Mexico, provided that we work things out in NAFTA to where the economic security of the country no, is at least as well David, protected David. Okay. as it would be in the context of these tariffs. So. He's already indicated a degree of flexibility, I think a very sensible, very balanced degree of flexibility. And I think that you're going to see, as you understand the details of what actually is going to happen, that we're not trying to blow up the world. There's no intention of that. We want to balance our needs to fix the trade deficit with the needs of the economy and the needs of the global economy itself. Uh, David, I have a question for you, if I may. Uh, one of the aspects of the 
uh, of the imposition of tariffs is in terms of steel is that you are going to be able to raise prices now. And that's going to be a very visible aspect, it seems to me, of the aftermath of these tariffs, in fact, if they're imposed. How do you think about that? Well, uh, certainly the market forces will be adjusted, but uh, if you just think about what the impact would be perhaps on the, the automotive market, our customers there, the average cost of an automobile is about $30,000, and yet the steel that goes into that is uh, somewhere between 800 and 1,000. So even if the prices would go up 10% or maybe even 20%, uh, that's really not that significant. And if you think of the change in prices from 2014 to 2015, it dropped something like 40% and the economy didn't even feel it. So this whole thing about the big impact on prices, it's completely overblown. What's important here is the safety and security of the United States of America. And if you don't yep. have a robust steel industry, you're not going to have a strong country. Yep. You have to have strong commodities business to make sure you have strong manufacturing, well, full th stop. Mr. Bird, that's something that, that suddenly I, I started thinking about because there, there's a, an idyllic notion we can return to the 70s or 80s and have hundreds of thousands of, of people in the steel industry and, and you know, factories reopening. But um, we, we've heard about automation in some of the, even in some of the foreign plants, and we know that the, the employees, the number that it takes to, to make steel is, is I don't know, I don't, maybe you know better than I, 10, 15, 20 percent of what it, it, it was maybe in the heyday. But when you make the point that we, you know, whether we ever get back to, to a large employment number, we need to be able domestically to make steel for, for defense and for infrastructure. So. You know, even if we don't get back to the, the previous numbers for, for number of people in that industry, I mean, I, I, that's why I think you're, you're talking about it a lot. We need a domestic steel industry that can't be put out of business by dumping. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If you think about it, I always go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, safety and security, and manufacturing is there too. Self-actualization is kind of right. the Instagram, the Facebook, the Twitter, all those kind of things that go on. If you take this away, our country can't self-actualize. If we, if we don't have manufacturing, we can't build the weapons to protect our nations. We can't make things that, that to make this country viable. You know, you could see a dust up at some important point in time. And if we're not manufacturing anything, we have these countries come against us. And about the only thing we can do is unfriend them on Facebook. <laughs> we have to be able to make things in the United yeah, States the, the, to be viable. The argument, That's the key issue. The other argument might be a losing one because maybe more people in other industries are affected by this negatively, millions of people theoretically, instead of the 140,000 in the steel industry. But when you make that point that, you know, even if it does automate, we should have the automated factories here. We shouldn't be have the right. automated factories somewhere else. And, and, well, I, and I'd contend that every country needs a, a strong commodities base. You can't have other people take care of you. You can't outsource your ability to take care of yourself. If you're doing that, you're dependent upon others. This is foundational to the United States of America. Secretary, and we have to okay. win this. Sorry, Mr. Well, Byrne. Secretary Ross, we, we just spoke with Carson Block, who says he's tracked this down. No question, the Chinese are cheating on this, and it's not just an aluminum and steel. It's much broader than that. Right. His concern, though, is that the tariffs aren't a way of directly attacking China, that this waters things down by pitting us against people who are, are countries who would normally be our allies. Greg Ipps says the same thing in the Wall Street Journal this morning, that we should be all getting on the same time, Syed, and, and, and targeting the one bad actor instead of allowing people to make us look like we're the bad actor. Right. Well, that's very true as a concept, but the reality is trade is much more complicated than that. Chinese direct shipments to the U.S. are actually a fraction of what they were several years ago. But the reality is that they're transshipping material through other countries. And that's why this has to be broader. You can't do it just by pinpointing China. We've already got lots and lots of trade orders against China on steel products. And all that happens is it's like whack-a-mole. They come up somewhere else. So it has to be a little more all-encompassing. But we hope and we believe that at the end of the day, there will be a process of working with the other countries that are our friends, who, by the way, are also somewhat victimized by the same practices. This is not going to be a big trade war. The president would not have 
indicated flexibility on Canada and Mexico if he just wanted to do very extreme things. This is a idea that's been thought through over time and watch the execution. Hey, well, were, were you in the room when, uh, when Gary Cohn said if, I mean, was there a comment like if you do this, I'm out? Do you know, can you give us some background on, on uh, the workings of, of, uh, of what was happening with, with Navarro, you, and, and Gary Cohn and the president? Well, I have a great deal of respect for Gary. He was the president of Goldman Sachs. He's made a very major contribution to this improved economic environment that we're in. He did very good work on the taxes. He's doing very good work on the infrastructure. So this is not about some sort of a palace coup. Um, Gary, as you know from all kinds of media, has been contemplating some sort of a move for some little while. I'd, and I think the important thing is he made very good contributions. We're not looking for a trade war. We're going to have sensible relations with our allies. And the very fact of people like U.S. Steel increasing their production is going to moderate any price increases that there may be. There, there, as more capacity is brought on stream, yep. there will be a lot of competition. W Wilbur, we're, we're going to do the ADP number uh, with Steve Leisman. If you and Mr. Bird can just, it'll be just a minute or two if you can stick around. Can we come back to you after we get the ADP number? Well, sh surely, surely. Okay, good. I'd be happy to stay here. The question is this, uh, Secretary. What's the sequence of things now? We've announced the, the possibility of imposing tariffs, but what happens now? Well, let me first reflect on the job report that just came out. Remember, the prior administration, many economists were saying, oh, you can have rapid growth. You can have much more increase in unemployment. It's happening. The, these reports, five in a row, are very, very strong reports. I think you should judge the president and you should judge his decisions by what actually happens, not by speculation as to what might happen or some fantasy thing. This president is determined to make a strong economy continue, make job growth continue, and to do it in a very orderly and organized way. That's what you're going to see as this rolls out. Yep. Keep going. Um, so, Wilbur, I, I just want to go back quickly to, you know, do you, do you have a, a, a person in mind that, that you'd like to work with on these things that, the, in terms of a replacement for, uh, for Gary Cohn? You probably heard uh, of, of one of our colleagues, Larry Kudlow. You know Larry. It would, would, is that a possibility? Is that something that, uh, that, that would make sense to you, even though he's anti-tariff? Well, I, I don't think I'm going to play placement agent on television. It's a decision for the president to make an important decision. He's thinking right now about who will be the replacement. I have no doubt that there will be very well qualified candidates and people who can continue the very good economic progress that we've been making would, already. Would you resign if the president went, if, let's say you had lost this and he, and he went with, with Cohn on this, would you have resigned, Wilbur? Oh, that's a very real hypothetical question. I, I don't think that that's something that we have to deal with today. The important thing today is this is not going to be a rash thing. This is going to be a sensible rollout. The, the, there is going to be relative peace and quietude, both within the White House and in terms of the economy. And we're not going to disrupt the very good jobs report that you just heard this morning and that you've heard for the last five months in a row. Just to put a fine point on that, uh, Mr. Secretary, does that mean that you think it is very likely that we will carve out exemptions for some of our trading partners and allies, that the, 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 this will not be unilaterally placed across the board? I, I, I think what's going to happen is this has focused everybody's attention that we need a real solution to the problem, to this problem of overcapacity and overproduction. I think everybody now is really focusing on solutions rather than just on talk. Hmm. The, these global steel forum that had been set up over a year ago got no place. It was talk, 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 
no action. Now we're moving into a phase of solutions, and I think you will find it will end up being a very constructive solution. It's not going to blow up anything at all, but we are going to help solve this problem of overcapacity and overproduction. David, let, let's talk about this from your perspective. You, you are now saying that you're going to bring 500 workers back to, to one of your plants in southern Illinois. That's based on the idea that these tariffs go through. If, if we don't see the tariffs go through, if there's another solution, if this winds up being tackled in NAFTA or other ways, does that make any difference to you at all? Well, we're opening uh, up Granite City, the one blast furnace at Granite City, because of uh, the uh, pending 232. And we're going to not speculate as to what happens after that, but based upon feedback from our customers and the orders that we see in it and the belief in the 232, we're, we're moving ahead. Beyond that, we'll have to see. I'm, I'm ready to turn on another blast furnace if the volumes are there. It's all about demand. One, one analyst on Wall Street downgraded U.S. Steel the other day because they didn't think that these tariffs would actually have a big impact because of the long-term contracts you already have with your customers. And, and based on this analyst's idea that these tariffs would, even if they go through, be unwound before you're able to really capitalize on it. Uh, in 2002, those, uh, those tariffs lasted just over a year and a half. What, what do you say to that? Well, we do think these things will last for some uh, period of time, and it'll be helpful for us. Remember, we announced uh, over a year ago that we're investing $2 billion through 2020 because we believe uh, that we can revitalize these assets, just not fix these assets, but put them in better state than they've ever been in. So we're committed to U.S. Steel, and when there's a pro-business climate like now, uh, we we have a really bright future. And I'm not going to debate uh, this downgrade from uh, the analysts, but uh, the reality is we feel like we're in a really good spot, and it feels like a renaissance now that the 232 is coming forward. Hey, Wilbur, last question, uh, and then I know you, you gentlemen have to run. Wilbur, you've done the, uh, the, the Campbell soup can and the, the, you know, the Budweiser can and talked about right. it's de minimis, but people have done... Uh, some calculations when you look through the whole supply chain and, and that it could add up to X amount of dollars. I've seen $9 billion as far as a tax on, on the U.S. consumer. You've talked about the jobs number and how that's from tax reform and, and all the, the positive things for the economy that the administration has done. Critics say this takes $9 billion out of that. This, this is the first sign that you're going to reverse some of the pro-business things that, that you've done. How would you respond to that? Well, let's put the $9 billion into perspective. We, we have a very, very big economy. This is less than one half of 1% impact on the economy. Nine billion sounds like a big number when you put it in isolation. When you compare it to the economy, it's not such a big number. Further, that makes the assumption that if every penny of the tariff increase gets put through and is reflected in product prices. I don't believe that will be true. I believe you will see other mills opening up. I believe you will see very intense competition for the incremental volume that's freed up by the tariffs or whatever subsequent measure we put in. And that competition will resist the prices going up quite as much as they otherwise would. Second, inflation has been very, very mild we actually could use a little bit more inflation. Remember, the Fed target is for 2%, and we've been struggling to get yep. up to 2 A little bit of inflation is good for the economy. Right. Runaway inflation obviously would be bad, but we're not talking about right. runaway. You're talking about fractions of a percent. Right. And I would say there are very few economists who can even accurately estimate what the economy will do to within a half a percent. Uh, well, I don't know if we need the inflation on beer prices, uh, uh, Mr. Commerce Secretary. But uh, anyway, thank you uh, for all your time. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.